An unexpected and unsettling event occurred as Muslims were engaged in their spiritual journey, upending the tranquility of the sacred space and sending them into a state of terror. An inexplicable force rose up from beneath the sacred Kaaba, sending a wave of fear through the assembled crowd. Worshippers were left wondering about the nature and significance of the supernatural force that had violated the sanctity of the holy site, the specifics of what the Muslims had witnessed, and the true significance of the ominous thing after witnessing this mysterious phenomenon which caused widespread confusion and anxiety. Join us in today's video to dive deeper into this event. The mysterious event at Kaaba during the Hajj pilgrimage sparks debate about supernatural forces and historical significance, including the discovery of a green stone and a skeleton near the holy site. During the Hajj pilgrimage, a mysterious and unsettling event occurred at the Kaaba in Mecca, leaving Muslims questioning the nature and meaning of the supernatural force that disrupted the sanctity of the holy site. Hazrat Abdullah bin Zuir initiated the reconstruction of the Kaaba, unearthing a green stone believed to be the resting place of Prophet Ismail and his mother Ha, with several peculiar phenomena occurring near the Kaaba throughout history. Ishmael and Hagar, his mother, are figures from the Bible and Islamic tradition. According to Islamic tradition, Hagar and Ishmael are believed to be buried in the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, near the Kaaba. The exact location of their graves is not publicly known, and visiting specific graves in the area is not encouraged in Islamic tradition. The focus of the pilgrimage to Mecca is on religious rituals and worship at the Kaaba and the surrounding areas. Prophet Ismail is the figure known in Judaism, Christianity and Islam as Abraham's son, born to Hagar. Ismail is regarded as a prophet and an ancestor to the last prophet Muhammad. He also became associated with Makkah and the construction of the Kaaba. Then, Ibrahim stayed away from them for a period as long as Allah wished and called on them afterward. He saw Ismail under a tree near Zamzam, sharpening his arrows. When he saw Ibrahim, he rose up to welcome him, and they greeted each other as a father does with his son, or a son does with his father. History tells us that Kaaba was destroyed more than once, so it was rebuilt several times. Kaaba has remained standing since the time of Prophet Ibrahim to this day. Prophet Ibrahim and the Prophet Ismail devoted a great deal of energy in building the Kaaba that thousands of men could not match. Allah does not tell us about the time of building the Kaaba and only tells things that are more important and more useful. He tells of the sanctity of the souls of those who built it Ibrahim and Ismail. Afterwards, Allah gave Ismail the duty of prophethood. He gave him the duty of guiding the people of Amalekah in Yemen. According to some sources, Ismail lived with this nation for 50 years and conveyed them the divine message and orders. Some of them believed in him, but others insisted on unbelief and polytheism. As it is understood from the statement of the Quran, Ismail acted in accordance with this principle of guidance. First, he himself practiced the religion. Then, he made his relatives practice it. After that, he conveyed the message of the religion to his nation. Ismail had 130 or 137 years when he died. He is reported to have had 12 sons. According to some sources, Ismail lived in Makkah till his death. Ismail, according to different sources, was buried alongside his mother Hajar near Kaaba in Masjid al-Haram. Allah knows best. Not only that, the discovery of a skeleton near the Kaaba has sparked debate about whether it signifies a past war between humans and the Nephilim, or is associated with the aftermath of the Ark incident, as chronicled in the Bible. The Nephilim were descendants of the physical relationship 
between the sons of God and the daughters of men, as mentioned in Genesis 6. 1. 4. There has been much debate about the identity of the sons of God. Our opinion is that the sons of God are fallen angels who have sex with women or possess men to have physical relations with women. The result of this union was the children of the Nephilim, who were heroes of old, men of great renown. So what are these Nephilim? According to Jewish and other legends, they were a race of giants and supermen who committed evil deeds. Their great size and strength may come from a mixture of demonic DNA and human genes. In the movie Noah, the Nephilim are fallen angels trapped in rock. All the Bible directly says about them is that they were heroes of old, famous men of one time. The Nephilim are not aliens, angels, guardians, or monsters in the rocks. They belong to a true race, born from the relationship of the sons of God and the daughters of men. The Nephilim were one of the main reasons for the flood during Noah's time. Immediately after mentioning the Nephilim, the Word of God says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the face of the earth. Every human heart is engrossed in planning evil and sinful things. The Lord regretted that he had created mankind on the earth. His heart is sad and sorrowful. So the Lord said, I will wipe out the people I have created from the face of the earth, humans, animals, reptiles, and birds in the sky. I am sorry that I have created them. Genesis 6, 5, 7. God sent a great war across the entire earth, killing all people and animals except Noah, his family, and the animals on his ark. All else was wiped out, including the Nephilim. Therefore, what was found in the Kaaba makes us think about the signs of the end times and the presence of the Antichrist. There are many pivotal moments in history, but they all pale in comparison to the great moment, the birth of Jesus. That moment brought light out of darkness, hope out of despair, and life out of death. Nothing has impacted the entire human race more than the entrance that Jesus made into our world. One moment, one divine moment, transformed reality for every individual. That's why understanding who Jesus is, simply Jesus, is absolutely essential. Interrogating apocalyptic depictions of Islam in spiritual warfare that have grown during the War on Terror, focusing on the Islamic Antichrist as both an individual figure and a corporate framing of Islam broadly. It contends that the chimerical figure of Islam comes to represent an inverted mirror of America's messianic imperialism, both reflecting its attributes and resulting from its actions. It charts these demonologies underlying structures of Islamophobia and anti-blackness as granting religious justification to domestic and transnational structures of imperial extraction, carceral violence, and militarization. Deconstructing demonologies of taqiyya and political blowback, it reveals the Islamic Antichrist as a spirit of colonial mimicry and anti-colonial and anti-racist violence which threatens the ontotheological structures of white Christian nationalism by articulating a demand for both reckoning and reparation. The word Antichrist appears in just three passages in the Bible. It does not appear at all in the Book of Revelation. Nevertheless, the idea of an Antichrist is central to the apocalyptic worldview that sees human history as a struggle between God and Satan. For the fate of mankind. According to most Christian prophecies of the end time, the Antichrist will act as Satan's chief agent on earth during this period. The Antichrist, a sort of evil twin of Jesus in many ways, will forge a one-world government through promises of peace. But when Jesus returns, he will expose the Antichrist as an imposter, defeat him in the Battle of Armageddon, and reign with the Christian martyrs for a thousand years on earth. The tribulation period begins peacefully. 
The Antichrist deceives people because he brings global peace temporarily. In fact, the Bible says through peace he will deceive many. Then this all culminates in the Battle of Armageddon, fought at the end of the tribulation period, and then comes the second coming of Jesus Christ. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers, a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. The Antichrist deception already begins to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment. The Church traditionally distinguishes between the Antichrist, understood to be a pseudo-messiah who will come at the end of time and lead the world against the Church in the final trial, and Antichrists, in the plural, who participate in various ways in the same spirit of Antichrist, who will personify the spirit or mind of the devil. 2 Thessalonians 2. 3, 12 describes the Antichrist as a person who will have all the power and deception of the devil himself. He will attempt to deceive people into believing that he is what he is not. Ultimately, he will claim himself to be God and only the coming of the Lord will stop him. Christ himself will finally defeat him and cast him into hell. Will the Antichrist be a Muslim? Only God knows. Are there connections between Islamic eschatology and Christian eschatology? There certainly seem to be direct correlations, though they are like reading the descriptions of a great battle, first from the perspective of the loser trying to save face, and then from the perspective of the victor. Of course, prophecies of the 12th Imam should not be considered equal to biblical prophecies. Only the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's possible to interpret some elements of Islamic eschatology in a way that agrees with Daniel and Revelation, but that does not lend any credence to the rest of Shiite theology. Until we see the fulfillment of these things, we need to heed the words of 1 John 4. 1. 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Who is Al-Masiyah Dajjal in Islamic eschatology? Dajjal is a prominent figure in Islamic end-time beliefs. Masi is an Arabic title applied to Jesus, roughly meaning Messiah. Dajjal means the greatest lie or most deceitful. Often referred to simply as Dajjal, this character is the Muslim equivalent to the Antichrist in Christian eschatology. According to Islamic beliefs concerning the end times, Dajjal will fool all the world's people, except for true Muslims, through miracles and other signs. Eventually, he will be killed when the true Jesus, known in Islam as Isa, returns to earth. Islam's concept of Al-Masih ad-Dajjal sourced from the Quran and traditional teachings known as the Hadith, is very descriptive. He is described with a bulging blind right eye and the Arabic word kafir, unbeliever, written on his forehead. His arrival is said to be preceded by intense worldwide immorality and violence. Immediately before Dajjal appears, there will be natural disasters and open satanic worship. Once on the scene, this false savior will fool people with miraculous powers and he will conquer the entire world except for the Islamic holy cities of Medina and Mecca. 
Muslims generally believe in the appearance of yet another end times figure known as the Mahdi, meaning guided one. This man will be the perfect Muslim and the leader of the worldwide Islamic people. He will defeat Al-Masih ad-Dajjal in cooperation with Jesus, who will return to earth. Isa will kill Dajjal with a spear and unite the world under the banner of true Islam. Sunni Muslims differ as to whether Isa and the Mahdi are separate figures. Shia Islam primarily identifies this Mahdi as the last Imam, a figure who has been on earth in hiding for many centuries. Ahmadiyya Muslims believe the Mahdi was their founder, Ghulam Ahmad. Similarities between Al-Masih ad-Dajjal and the Antichrist are not surprising. Very early in its history, Islam was critiqued for appropriating and misrepresenting Christian beliefs. Muhammad often claimed the Bible supported his message. He suggested that if people would read it and consult with Jews and Christians, they would see that what he said was true. Of course, as Islam spread, scholars began to point out that Muhammad's knowledge of Judeo-Christianity, including issues such as the Trinity, Jesus, history, and the Old Testament, was contrary to what those faiths taught and preached. Islamic teachings on the end times demonstrate heavy influence from Christian eschatology. Variations of the Antichrist, the Tribulation, and the Millennial Kingdom are part of most Islamic denominations' view of the last days. Al-Masih ad-Dajjal is an especially prominent example of this borrowing. What is the great deception in the Bible? Usually, when people speak of the great deception, they refer to 2 Thessalonians 2.11, which predicts that God will, in an end times judgment, send a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. This great deception is associated with the satanic work of the Antichrist and his displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. The same passage in 2 Thessalonians also speaks of a great apostasy that will take place before the man of lawlessness is revealed. Similar apostasies are predicted elsewhere. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Of course, people are complicit in the deception, for they reject the truth and prefer lies. Jesus spoke about a time to come when the deception will be especially great, when false messiahs and false prophets will appear. Even the people of God could be deceived if it were not for God's providential protection. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. All of these deceptions are instigated by the devil. However, 2 Thessalonians 2.11 also speaks of deception as God's punishment for people who refuse to believe the truth. The context seems to be similar to that of the Gospel passages above and speaks of one to come who will be especially deceptive. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In this passage, after people have refused the truth for so long, God causes them to believe what is false, a strong delusion. This is not an instance where God actively deceives people. Rather, God is simply giving those who reject the truth what they really want. We see a similar pattern in Romans 1.18.25, where people reject God's truth for so long that He simply abandons them to their own sinfulness. They have, as it were, crossed the point of no return. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them.
for since the creation of the world god's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. The deception spoken of in the Gospels has to do with false prophets and messiahs who appear and seem to be authenticated by miracles. Taking the futurist position, we see the great deception spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2 as a future event associated with the coming of the Antichrist after the rapture of the Church. Those who are perishing will willingly embrace the imitation and follow the beast of the end times. They will perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. We don't know exactly what the great deception will be, only that it will be a strong delusion capable of swaying the world's allegiance toward the Antichrist. The Bible says that in the time of the Antichrist and false prophet, there will be many signs to bolster their lies. It is hard to imagine, but the deception during the tribulation will be worse than all of Satan's other deceptions. The Antichrist will have a deadly wound healed. His image will breathe and speak and give orders, etc. In the broader sense, anyone who rejects the truth of God is being deceived. And at some point, God may simply abandon him to the deception that he has willingly embraced. There are plenty of false teachers today who claim to teach God's word, some claim to be Christians, and some claim to bring a word from God from outside of the Bible. It is vitally important that every Christian compare every teaching with what the Bible says and spend the time necessary to evaluate what is being taught. This is the mission of Got Questions, and in keeping with that mission, we would encourage every reader to compare what we say with Scripture as well. The Antichrist's defeat by the Messiah signifies a period of spiritual and moral challenges, serving as a reminder for believers to remain steadfast and prepared for transformative events in human history. Armalis is associated with the Antichrist, a tyrannical ruler who opposes God and seeks to subjugate the world, and his defeat by the Messiah signifies a period of intense spiritual and moral challenges. This presence serves as a reminder for believers to remain steadfast in their beliefs and resist deception as the signs of the great hour signify a transformative event in human history. The Antichrist is seen as a precursor to a transformative event, serving as a reminder of the need for spiritual preparedness and adherence to moral principles with specific details associated with the Antichrist in Islamic apocalyptic traditions. So what should we do? We must be spiritually prepared and vigilant for the return of Jesus to vanquish evil, emphasizing the importance of unwavering faith. The importance of spiritual preparedness and discernment in recognizing the signs of deception and the belief in Jesus Christ as a savior who will vanquish evildoers is outlined in the book of Revelation. The second coming of Jesus represents the culmination of God's plan for humanity, with varying interpretations among Christian denominations, but believers find hope and motivation in the prospect of ultimate victory over evil. Jesus will save humanity by destroying evildoers when he returns, but the exact time is unknown, so believers must always be ready and focused on Jesus. We are called to stay vigilant and prepared for the imminent return of Jesus Christ, emphasizing the importance of spiritual preparedness, discernment, 
and unwavering faith. Moreover, we must be spiritually awake, cultivate a personal relationship with Jesus through prayer, and strengthen our faith in preparation for the Lord's return. We are reminded to be spiritually awake and alert, to cultivate a personal relationship with Jesus through prayer, and to strengthen our faith in preparation for the Lord's return. The act of prayer is a means of aligning one's will with the divine will and seeking God's guidance, as exemplified by the Lord's Prayer. Believers are preparing for Jesus' return, which holds theological implications of divine justice and the ultimate triumph of good over evil, shaping their worldview, moral conduct, and hope for the future. Prepare for the Lord's return through prayer, repentance, and spiritual growth, aligning with the teachings of Jesus and fostering spiritual intimacy and alignment with God's will. We are spiritually preparing for the imminent return of Jesus Christ, which carries theological implications of divine justice, righteousness, and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. The return of Jesus holds significant implications for us, shaping their worldview, moral conduct, and hope for the future, serving as a reminder of the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises and the assurance that justice will prevail, calling believers to live faithfully and participate in God's redemptive work, instilling profound hope and responsibility as they eagerly anticipate the fulfillment of God's promises in the second coming. That's all about today's video. We're very happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like and subscribe. Don't forget to turn on the bell to watch the latest videos on our channel. Hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye.